Okay, so I'm Professor Igor Rudan, and I'll present you the Equist tool. The Equist tool, equitable impact sensitive tool for prioritizing health interventions. I'll tell you a little bit about how this tool came about, what was the need for it, how it arose, and uh, how it was implemented, or how it should be implemented. The whole history of global health economics goes back to this very important book. This was World Development Report in 1993 uh, by the World Bank. It was called Investing in Health. One of the key messages was that increasing funding for battling diseases in poor countries, which was then estimated at a mere $41 per person each year, was uh, just the 30th part of what was spent in rich countries. And it would not only reduce the burden of disease, but it would also dramatically improve the economies. So this was the first time when people started putting together under the same umbrella health and wealth and uh, thinking uh, what were their interactions. How did health of a nation uh, impact the wealth of the nation and how did the wealth of the nation potentially impact health of the nation? And people realized that they are connected as you would imagine uh, and expect. So there was a clear link between health, poverty, and economy. And poor health not only was an additional drain, but also a cause of poverty and weak economy. So from that onwards, a lot of thinking was going into how, do you, uh, how much money do you put in health, and how do you split this money? Because you could invest in health research to develop some new health interventions. You could invest in building your uh, health system and you could invest in educating uh, your health workers, uh, people uh, who work in health. You could also invest in interventions, uh, in treatments. And finally, you could invest in preventive activities, right? Um, and uh, all of this uh, together uh, needs to be somehow rationalized because clearly, the, depending on what kind of decisions you make, your outcomes will uh, be vastly different and you want them to be as cost effective as possible. So as a result of this book, I think um, a lot of people started thinking about cost effectiveness concept in uh, global health and intervention planning and what is a good value for money and what is not such a good value for money. Now, in order to prioritize interventions, you do need to acquire uh, uh, some concepts that come from uh, really epidemiology. Uh, and and uh, uh, let us think of some population somewhere. And if all these people that you see here, if they all started complaining about their diseases, and if they put all their health complaints on a piece of paper and put it in one big barrel, then that barrel would be their burden of disease, their total burden of disease. So all of their problems basically would be their burden of disease. But then the problems would be even worse than they have to be because some of those people would expose themselves to some risks. Like these people could be smoking, right? Or these people here could be drinking and some people here could be both <coughs> drinking and smoking. And then these people here could be exposed to some solid uh, fuel fumes within their households and some people are exposed to all three, but some are not exposed to any, as you can see. So there's a lot of variation within the population. And because of this risk exposure, which is not necessary, the burden of disease actually goes up. And this is what you see when you come to some population. You see part of the burden which is just inherent biologically to those people um, from their interaction with microbes or whatever, but then, or aging. But this is then unnecessary additional risk, right? Because drinking, smoking, solid fuel use indoors. But the situation is never as bad either because government or people themselves also implement some health interventions, which could be vaccination maybe or anti-alcoholic group, uh, support group. And thanks to those things, the risks are actually, the burden is smaller than it could be, okay? So this is basically what you see when you come to some uh, population. If you came to an island, uh, full of people, uh, this would tell you the architecture of their disease burden. Not only you want to know the actual burden of disease, which could go up 
and down, as we could see, but you also want to understand the architecture of the burden so that you, could, you, you know that if you expanded this intervention to everyone in the population, how much would you reduce the burden? Or if these people started being exposed to more and more risks, how much you would increase? So you want to understand where you are at the moment, but also what are your uh, options for uh, reducing the burden of disease uh, effectively or uh, how, worse, how much worse could it get if you stop delivering these interventions or if more people got exposed to more uh, risks. So those are the things you, need to, uh, you want to understand um, as a health uh, economist or epidemiologist. So what do we see from already from these first um, um, type of thinking about uh, prioritization of interventions? There are several important things to consider when you prioritize interventions. Firstly, you need to understand the relationship between the investments you make and how much of the population can you actually cover with that intervention. So that is captured by the efficiency of intervention delivery. Okay? So that's the first thing uh, to think about. How efficiently can you cover your population with interventions. How much does it cost you to cover 10%, 20%, 50%, 100% of population, right? Because for some interventions you may be very efficient and it doesn't cost much. For some interventions it costs quite a lot. And not just that, for some interventions it may cost the same to cover the whole population, uh, no matter whether you're poor or wealthy. But for some interventions it may be easy to deliver them to city center of the capital city, but it may be very difficult to deliver them to uh, outposts, uh, to borders, to people who are you know, remote and outside of access of roads and so on. So the cost may start going up. So this is what efficiency of intervention delivery means. It means how much does it cost you to cover the first 10%, then 20, 50, 100% of people in your country with some intervention. The second thing we need to know is what is the relationship between achieved coverage and the potential impact fraction? Now, why would that matter, you can ask? Uh, why? I mean, you, you can assume that if some intervention protects you 100% from 100% of disease, then if you cover 100% of population, you would just get rid of the disease, you would eradicate it. But the problem is that there is something called um, quality of intervention delivery as well, right? Because if you have vaccine and you need to give three doses, but you're trying to deliver them somewhere quite remote, and people there have low levels of acceptability of uh, vaccines or some negative feelings towards vaccines and they just complete one dosage or there is a breakage of the cold chain and vaccines don't, um, uh, don't work when they get there or people are just not trained to deliver them properly um, who are working there at the outpost, you know, then you, your intervention is no longer 100% effective, the effectiveness actually drops and you don't know by how much does it drop, but this is very important to know because then even if you cover 100% of your population, you will not get 100% effectiveness. There's still going to be people getting a disease even if you think that you covered everyone. Now the third thing to think about is what is the relationship between potential impact fraction and the removed burden of disease? Now why is this important? This is important because the burden of disease is not spread equally across the country. The burden of disease may be much lower in central Bogota than it is going to be, or uh, you know, Abidjan or Lagos, than it's going to be in the very remote rural areas. So the burden may be clustering in the poorest 20% of the population, whereas it may be very low in the wealthiest 20% of population, which means that it is not the same, it's not going to be the same if you achieve 50% coverage in the central uh, uh, capital city and if you achieve 50% coverage somewhere remotely. If you achieve 50% coverage, you're going to be able to remove far more of the national uh, level burden of disease than if you just do it in the center of capital city. Clearly in the center of capital city it's probably cheaper, more efficient to deliver, the quality is going to be better 
but the burden that you're going to be affecting there is going to be lower, right? So it's great that you're being effective and uh, that you're achieving fantastic quality of delivery, but you're achieving it on a very small part of your national burden. Whereas if you really want to get rid of the burden um, uh, which is troubling you in your country, then you want to actually go out there, but there it's going to cost you far more to achieve the same coverage and the quality of delivery may not be that good and then you're not going to be achieving how, mu uh, the, 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 how much you want to achieve. Now these things are important because all of them contribute to the final cost effectiveness of the intervention. When you then go back to saying, okay, I invested one million, how many deaths did I avert? or how much of the burden of prevalence or whatever did I avert. And do you see now how difficult it is to say what's going to be most, more cost effective? It's extremely difficult to say because you would need to know extremely well um, whether it's better to invest one million in a poor rural area, um, uh, clearly with one million if the quality of intervention delivery and efficiency were the, exactly the same, clearly you would have far more impact on the burden in a poor rural area than you would in the central capital city. But maybe not, because if the quality of intervention delivery dropped so much by the time you got there, and if paying to deliver it there is so much, uh, the cost is so much higher, then the net effect, you just don't know what is going to be. And the information that you need to know this is not really easily available. And this is what we need to achieve. We need to really uh, uh, figure out what is the key pieces of information that we would need to have in order to predict what's going to be more or less cost effective. Okay? So there is a very complex interplay between the efficiency of intervention delivery quality of intervention delivery, effectiveness of intervention, and the cost effectiveness of intervention. And never mind the equity, which becomes another important problem. This is from the paper in The Lancet in 2010. It was a paper by UNICEF team. Uh, and they were really puzzled by something that they did not expect. So everyone wanted to reduce child mortality and everyone wanted to reduce child mortality in the most cost-effective way. Clearly, any money intended to redu the reduction of child mortality was seen as a very important, useful money, and you don't want to squander money intended to reducing uh, child mortality in the world. So you want to obviously do it in the most cost-effective way. So everyone's mantra was for years, let's reduce child mortality in the most cost-effective way. But what UNICEF realized is something strange. If you just follow only the criterion of cost effectiveness, you will reduce the mortality. And people assumed that you will then also decrease inequality between children, because surely the majority of the burden is in the poorest uh, parts of the country. So if you're reducing that burden, you are going to improve equity as well. But look what happened. These are the countries with decreasing under-5 mortality and decreasing inequality in under-5 mortality between poorest and the richest within the country. Look at how few countries had the reduction of the child mortality and reduction of equity at the same time. Most countries were here. They decreased under-5 mortality but increased inequality in under-5 mortality between poorest and the richest. Now, very few countries were in the other two quadrants, because those were increasing under five mortality during the time when everyone's trying to decrease it. But this is the absolute uh, worst, because not only that uh, the under five mortality was increasing, but also inequality uh, was increasing. But OK, so now never mind these countries that are just failed countries, which obviously are not working. Their health systems are not working. They need to cope with many, many problems before they can actually even become get here on the left part. So luckily, at least, we have most countries on the left part of the graph where child mortality is going down. Okay? But this is the problem. Child mortality is going down, but inequity is going up. Nobody sees this as a problem. So let me explain to you why is this uh, one of the biggest problems in global health at all. That means that if you say have a $1 million and you have any poor country, 
it means that if you're just following the cost effectiveness criterion, you're going to save thousand child lives in the central capital city with this one million potentially. But you could also save 800 child lives in a poor rural region. And if you're just looking at cost effectiveness, well, one million thousand lives saved for one million dollars is more cost effective than 800 lives saved for one million dollars. But that means that you're going to be helping children in the central capital city because it's more efficient and better quality of delivery so, and, and there's still enough burden there to prioritize that over going to the poor region. So now the question became, are we allowed to sacrifice 200 child lives in central uh, of the capital city in order to reduce inequity and actually go and help the poorest? And nobody knew the answer to that question. So, and nobody wanted to give the answer to that question because it's an impossible uh, question. You, nobody wants to increase inequities, but nobody also wants to sacrifice 200 lives if they can uh, save them. But it seemed that the whole context in some countries is such that the quality of delivery is so poor as you move away from the central areas and that uh, the efficiency of delivery is so inefficient that instead of improving things nationally when you go to help the poor, you're actually missing out <laughs> and, and doing harm to someone you could save in the central areas. So clearly people uh, realize that we need to understand far better the context and we need to work hard towards improving the context so that we don't have that kind of dilemma in global health because we don't want to have this kind of dilemma. This is a terrible dilemma uh, to have. All right? and, and nobody wants to say it's fine to sacrifice 200 lives um, um, to, to be improving in inequity as a principle, but nobody wants to reduce child mortality while making it even worse for the poor children uh, uh, than, than it was before, right? Okay, so another thing that we should also perhaps remind ourselves is that equality is sameness, giving everyone the same thing. But that's only going to work if everyone starts from the same place. What we want is equity, fairness, which uh, 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 everyone has access to same opportunities and we must uh, sure Early ensure equity before we can then enjoy uh, equality, right? So nobody wants to skip on an opportunity to, to do this. I mean, when you really think about this picture, maybe we should not encourage people not to pay uh, and, and go and watch the baseball uh, game uh, with a ticket, uh, you know, rather than watching it this way. But uh, anyway, you get the, the message, right? Okay. So now back to the year 2012. Um, in year 2012, a group of people gathered um, and tried to seize the opportunity to really uh, expand and enhance the agenda over childhood pneumonia and diarrhea. Because the work of Child Health Epidemiology Reference Group, which worked with WHO and UNICEF as a set of independent consultants, have been the first to really charge the causes of global child mortality uh, in the first years of the 21st century. And what, they, what was the big surprise is that half of the child deaths all over the world were due to two causes that people just thought were a nuisance but not really killing anyone and that was childhood pneumonia and childhood diarrhea. So that was the big surprise and the big finding of the CHIRG and uh, luckily, thanks to that uh, insight, uh, the child mortality has reduced, childhood pneumonia and diarrhea have reduced in the next uh, decade. So 2012 was a good time to really then try to finish off that agenda and really make a push on childhood pneumonia and diarrhea. So Lancet has commissioned uh, a series on childhood pneumonia and diarrhea uh, in early 2012. And this put together the group from Johns Hopkins University who were leaders in diarrhea and Edinburgh University who are leaders in pneumonia and UNICEF with Mickey Chopra and uh, WHO with Liz Mason who was leading the maternal and child and newborn health department at the time. 
So all of them came together to develop a series for the Lancet on childhood pneumonia and diarrhea. And as we were working on that series, UNICEF has uh, realized all this uh, problem of equity versus cost effectiveness. And Mickey was desperately trying to make a big deal out of this and use the whole series of on pneumonia and diarrhea, which are inherently diseases of poor people and of, 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 the, of the poverty, uh, to somehow push this whole uh, problem and put it in the focus of global health community because he knew that this series would be very um, uh, well read and he thought this is a great opportunity to also push the agenda of equity. So uh, I got the contract from UNICEF as a consultant to uh, develop a framework which would expose both cost effectiveness and equity within the same tool uh, and uh, Mickey and Harry Campbell from Edinburgh University have been guiding me for this and mentoring me and, and, and helping me. And basically I've developed the paper which presented the first conceptual framework which visualized both the cost effectiveness and equity criterion in the same framework and UNICEF then picked it up as something they uh, wanted to develop as a data science platform for each country so that they can uh, look at that and they can make their decisions based on um, uh, on this framework so that they keep in mind both cost effectiveness and equity. And then very quickly afterwards, so the first paper was published in Journal of Global Health in June 2012 as we were working on the series on childhood pneumonia and diarrhea, diarrhea. and then very quickly afterwards we published with the help of our student Donald Waters, who was leading this, and Evi Teodorato, who is a statistician here uh, and a professor of epidemiology and a researcher and um, uh, many uh, other things she does here for us. So Evi and Donald um, have helped uh, Hari, Miki and I to run the first uh, example on five countries to show how Equist could actually be used and how it could work. So that paper was published in December of 2012. By that time, we have completed the Lancet series, which then was published in April um, 2013 in the Lancet. But these two papers became kind of a spin-out of that work on the series, which was done here at Edinburgh University with UNICEF only. And then UNICEF took it up and developed it into a data science platform, which we will hear uh, later, right? What I'm going to show you in the rest of this presentation is how this whole thing is supposed to work. So this was my very first attempt at this. Uh, now we made it a bit uh, nicer but, and more um, uh, easy, easy, easily followed. But this was my first attempt of this. It was kind of a four quadrant uh, framework that showed you uh, five lines within each quadrant, each line corresponds to one equity stratum. So you have quintiles of equity. Q1 is the population which is the best of. Q5 is the poorest part of the population. And obviously each quintile represents 20% of the population. So this, you know, going from 0 to 20% means achieving coverage of the whole uh, quintile 1. Uh, and also in quintile 3, going from 0 to, uh, to, to, to the full, uh, means uh, covering 20% of population. So the y-axis is the whole population. This is why each of these lines only goes up to 20%, because those are the quintiles by equity. And what you can see here is that this is the money, x-axis is the money, y-axis is the coverage. So you remember what I said about efficiency, graph efficiency of the coverage? It asks the question, how much money do I need to achieve the full coverage within this quintile? And you can see that to cover everyone in quintile one, you don't need that much money. Maybe this is 50 million, 100 million for some country and so on. So you need maybe 70 million to cover the entire quintile one. To cover with the same intervention the entire quintile two, you need 150 million. 
the entire quintile 3 becomes more expensive and what you see here is quintile 4 you can still cover but you need much more money than quintile 1 whereas in quintile 5 you cannot even cover everyone because some people are just completely inaccessible in some countries no matter how much money you give the government they're not going to be able to reach everyone as we know and then you take this 20% coverage into effectiveness graph where what is here on x-axis it is potential impact fract fraction how what proportion of the burden within this quintile can you actually remove if you cover this many people so this should be actually ideally the same so if it is um, uh, you know if, if this is um, something uh, that is effective 100 percent then it should be 100 percent but we know that because of the uh, difference in quality it is not 100 percent and then this is the burden size if you uh, got rid of 25 percent of your burden um, uh, how many deaths this really is if you get rid of 25 percent of the burden in quintile one when the wealthy are you know there's simply not many uh, 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 there's simply not many uh, of deaths here that you can remove whereas 25 percent removal in quintile four means many deaths and now thanks to all this you take deaths back to the money and you see how many deaths you actually avert for how much money and this is your cost effectiveness uh, graph. Obviously you want to be somewhere here, not somewhere here. Okay? Why? Because here means that you didn't spend too much money and you still averted many deaths. If you're somewhere here, it means that you spend a lot of money but you did not avert many deaths. So this is your cost effectiveness graph and it shows you how various ideas of spending in various quintiles of the population eventually turn out to be cost effective and this graph now allows you all of a sudden to compare cost effectiveness of various ideas that you have about spending your money but at the same time being very well aware on which part of the population are you serving so that you can then pick something that is in the end both, both cost effective and serving the uh, poor uh, segments of the population. So let's go through the whole thing once again to remind ourselves. This, this, these lines are probably more realistic than in my very first graph which may even be incorrect in, in a few uh, places. That was just the very first idea which I then took the snapshot of but this is what it really looks like. So the first thing efficiency. How much money do you need to achieve how much coverage in each quintile of the population by uh, their socioeconomic status. So quintile one, the wealthiest in the population, clearly you need maybe here 20 million and you cover everyone. Everyone means 100% of quintile one, but it also means obviously 20% of the whole national population, right? Because a quintile is 20% of the population. Here you need 60 million or 70 million, oh no, no, even more, more than 100 million to cover everyone in quintile 2. Quintile 3 demands 250 million. Quintile 4 cannot even be reached in this country. Quintile 5, same thing, you know, you can keep investing. You're not going to reach anyone anymore after a while. Okay, so now that we are familiar with that, we take this intervention coverage into the effectiveness graph. We change x-axis. Now we're looking into potential impact fraction. And you see Q1 needs to be here. This is by far the best you can achieve. This intervention, if implemented in ideal scenario, will reduce 55% of the burden of disease in that equity stratum. Which means that if you had 1,000 deaths in a central of your capital city, which is 20% of your national population, if you had 1,000 deaths, this intervention can remove 550 deaths. If you cover everyone in your uh, uh, quintile one, you will remove 550 deaths. And you would wish that the same applies to quintile two, where you may have 2,000 deaths, but you will not remove, uh, uh, you will not remove 55% of those deaths uh, in quintile two because of the quality dropping and the quality dropping means that your effectiveness dropped down to 50%. So you will only avert 1,000 
deaths out of 2,000. So in, you, you can already now start to see how this works. 1,000 deaths here, but 550 averted. 2,000 deaths here, more deaths, but 1,000 averted. So that's, that's better, actually, if this cost the same. But the problem is that this does not cost the same. Quintile 2 is going to be more costly than Quintile 1. And then Quintile 3, again, is going to be more costly to achieve less coverage, maybe 40%, but the bigger burden. And now you hopefully realize uh, how the burden increases, so the potential impact increases, but the quality decreases and the cost also increases. So there are three different things, and they all need to be understood well because their interplay is what eventually determines the outcome. So you take that potential impact fraction for each quintile, so that means that we would need to know how the effectiveness of interventions change, changes by quintile depending on quality. And you keep your x-axis, but now you get to the burden. And now you see that if you could get rid of 50% of the burden by covering everyone in quintile 1, you would remove 550 deaths or 500 deaths, right? But in quintile 2, you would remove more. Quintile 3, even more, 4 and 5 is where the majority of your burden lies. But this is also where the quality decreases and the cost increases. So you have no idea uh, what your cost effectiveness is going to end up being. And this is why I have huge skepticism towards any cost effect effectiveness estimates, because they just ignore these problems and this uh, stratification by equity in the country. They just plug one number for cost, one number for intervention effectiveness, one number uh, for the burden of disease, you know, which is national, and then they calculate cost effectiveness. But clearly that's not how it works. There is a far more complex underlying uh, picture and you can not just substitute the whole nation with one number of uh, burden of disease and, and, and think this is going to be your cost effectiveness. You need to understand these things because your cost effectiveness are, is going to totally depend on the interplay between these three things. If everyone, in, if the country is equitable, then you almost may just use one number because these things are not going to matter that much. But if country is inequitable as they usually are, then these things are going to have huge importance, all right? And then finally, you take those numbers of deaths averted and put it back in relation to your cost, which you started with. And then if you tested whether it's better to invest 150 million in quintile 3 or 230 million in quintile 4, you now realize that this is where you end up with, with the first idea, this is where you end up with, this, with the second idea. And what does this mean? What is most co more cost effective? A is more cost effective because we said anything towards here in this stripe will be more cost effective than anything in this stripe, all right? But the trouble is that this was investing in quintile 3 and this was investing in quintile 4. So now we need to figure out what if you invested the same amount of money, where would you be? Uh, you know, if you invested the same amount of money, what would then be more uh, cost effective? And every time you find out that you could be equity neutral, which means quintile 3, or equity promoting, which means quintile four and five, and still more cost effective than alternatives, this is where you should place your chips basically and, and invest your money. This is what makes then a good uh, use of money and at the same time being equitable, all right? So now you can understand that what we need to try to aim for is to, to, to reduce the divergence of these lines because the best way for us to be both equitable and cost effective is to reduce the diversion of these lines and create the context in which it's not going to cost that much to uh, cover everyone in quintile five. But for that we need to build infrastructure, we need better roads, we need to train people better, we need to have fantastic uh, mobile units and teams and the refrigerators along the way and electricity. So basically the with the development of the country uh, development of infrastructure in the country and the health system is going to reduce the divergence in these lines and in these lines but also then in these lines and you will be able to become cost effective and equitable in the same time, right? But 
The problem is with some countries, um, we have to admit this, that these lines diverge are, are diverging so much, these first and the second graph, that unfortunately, although the, those who are worse off have much bigger burden than the rest of the country, the cost and the lack of quality is such that it is not going to be cost effective to invest in, in saving lives there, which is a, a tragedy really, you know. And, and, and in fact, if you go and try to save lives there, you will be uh, losing somebody else's lives and you're, you're going to be sacrificing lives that you could save and you could save more lives by being inequitable. So it's a not, not only that there's already problems in poor countries of all sorts, but the worst of them all perhaps is that, you know, if you are helping the poorest of the poor, you are in fact sacrificing the lives of everyone else because you could save more lives for the same amount of money because your context is just so bad that you can't even make helping the poor cost effective. You know, that is a tragedy. So uh, when we see a country like that, then the priority should be really a political priority of building the infrastructure so that we are no longer in such situation because we don't want to be making those kinds of uh, decisions. And now we can have a look at some uh, random example. So you could be uh, a policymaker uh, in charge of a budget of a country, and you can have a look at various uh, number of scenarios which you would like to explore, and then you end up with a bunch of dots here, and you realize this is the most cost-effective one, but it's helping quintile one. This is a cost-effective one, but quintile two, quintile three. So this is one of these examples of these countries where Unfortunately, we cannot find an idea which would be more cost effective than helping the wealthiest simply because these lines are just so divergent. Although you can see that the bulk of the burden is in the among the poorest, but these lines, um, the first and second line are so divergent that you cannot find a solution to, um, to, to, to help the poor and be cost effective, okay? But now, this was just a hypothetical graph. What really happens when you take some examples of the countries? So I've just finished the presentation of the conceptual framework, which was the first paper in Journal of Global Health in 2012. Now I'm moving to the second paper that was December 20, um, 2012. Um, and uh, we had a student, Donald Waters, and our professor uh, of epidemiology here, Ivi Teodoratu, uh, join forces under our mentorship to look at the DHS data and any data they could find from anywhere in internet that tried to run equis for five completely different countries. Cambodia, Bangladesh, Egypt, Nigeria and Peru. So the countries that cannot be more uh, uh, different and all of them low and middle income countries and uh, we wanted to see how does Equist work in these countries? And for the case of childhood pneumonia, because we already were working on the series on the Lancet had so much data on pneumonia that is very, um, very practical for us here in Edinburgh being the leaders in this field to run this for pneumonia. So let's see what happens. Firstly, what we needed was the under five mortality rate by wealth quintile um, and look at the big, uh, how, how big the differences are. Peru is always the best off, and then Egypt was worst, and then Cambodia was worst, and then Bangladesh was worst, and finally Nigeria was uh, 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 the worst, apparently, right? And uh, that was to show how vast the differences in under five mortality rate were within these countries. And that gave us the burden for those five countries by equity strata from the DHS. And all of them from similar years between 2007 and 2010. But look what's really interesting. You would not see this from the first picture uh, easily because Peru had such a low uh, under five mortality rate. But when you divided the under five mortality rate in the poorest quintile of the country, with that in the wealthiest quintile of the country, this is the ratio you get. And then you realize that Bangladesh is the 
most equitable of these countries, in fact, I, I mean, I, I hope it's not because just everyone is so poor there, uh, but uh, rather that it's also rather equitable uh, country. Whereas look at Peru. I mean, Peru is not bad uh, in terms of under five mortality rate, but the inequity in Peru is, is, is really striking. I mean, uh, uh, the child, which is in the poorest quintile, has 6.5 times greater uh, likelihood to die uh, within the first five years than the child in the wealthiest quintile. I mean, that is a shocking level of inequity because you can see that even in uh, Nigeria, it's two and a half times, Bangladesh is two times, and uh, uh, Cambodia is three times. So Cambodia is, I mean, they're all inequitable, clearly, but, but the best is Bangladesh. Uh, a child in the poorest quantile has only two times bigger uh, chance of dying uh, before the fifth birthday than, than the child in the wealthiest quintile. That's, that's terrible, but it's, it's not as terrible as Peru, where it's 6.5 times. That is a really, really terrible level of inequality. So, so this is just to set your expectations toward these countries. You can see that they differ vastly in the number of deaths they record per population, and that Nigeria is really doing worse and Peru doing best. But in terms of inequity, Peru is the most inequitable and Bangladesh is reasonably uh, equitable. So let's remember this as we go through the thing. So now let's see what would it cost to do something um, to, to, to introduce, say, community case management, because community case management could deal with both pneumonia and diarrhea. And um, we are hoping that it has a very uh, high effectiveness as an intervention against those two diseases, perhaps even 80%. Uh, percent. So let us see what is the coverage of community case management by wealth quintile. And you can see dramatic differences between countries again. You can see how incredibly low uh, community case management is uh, in Bangladesh. It hardly reaches 5% even in the wealthiest quintile of the country in, in these years. I, I have to say this was in 2007, 8, 9, so situations have changed since clearly, but this is very illustrative for, for the time. But look then, for example, for um, uh, Nigeria, where in fact the coverage in the wealthiest in Nigeria is 35%, so one in three children covered by community case management in Nigeria if they're in wealthiest quintile, but only 10% if they're in the poorest quintile. Then you have an example of perhaps Egypt, where amazingly, uh, you know, it's all between kind of 50 and 60 percent, so high levels of coverage. And uh, Peru looks good as well, because look, okay, the wealthiest uh, reach even 90 percent, but the poorest are also reaching 70 percent. So clearly this must be some of the reasons why Peru's child mortality uh, in general is quite low because their community case management coverage is quite high. But clearly there must be then, so you remember what I said, with 70% of coverage you would not expect such dramatic differences then between first and the fifth quintile, but this coverage is not everything. You remember that the quality of coverage also matters. So the quality of this coverage may not be as uh, good as we would uh, like if the differences in survival eventually are so striking, right? And then we started putting some uh, numbers. We were interested in the cost of community case management per child treated in each country by wealth quintile. And uh, because you remember that this was something we needed for the first graph, we needed to understand how much does it cost us. And these are the figures that Donald and Evie came up with. $170 per child treated in wealthiest, free 11 uh, in uh, Nigeria, so uh, about twofold difference, even more. In Egypt, not such a big difference. Bangladesh also. So, so, so clearly, it costs more in each country, but about two to three times, all right? So, or one, in, or one to two, two times. Um, Can I ask from the previous one? So, when you say, is it costing more to treat the poor children? Of course, it's always costing more to treat the poor children because simply, if you want to treat someone in the capital uh, of uh, any country in the city center, uh, 
you hardly have any cost. The infrastructure is already there, health system is functional already there, you have your best uh, trained people already there, the kids only take uh, 100 yards to get to the hospital, so there's hardly any cost. Now, to, uh, to see a kid in a rural, uh, a poor, remote region, uh, you, the, the child needs to get there somehow, uh, care seeking needs to be even present, so that means that the uh, parents need to know enough um, uh, to recognize the symptom and also be willing to uh, go to the healthcare system rather than a local shaman or um, someone who uh, is in charge in the village as a religious leader perhaps or so on and then maybe uh, treating there. Uh, and, um, uh, and then there you will not have um, a person who is perhaps qualified enough to deliver this intervention in the way they should be. There may not be stocks of antibiotics there which uh, you have in the center so uh, people may be reluctant to even take antibiotics or give them properly or in the right dosage and so on and the antibiotics may be out of date already so you know there's tons of things that are making the uh, delivery of intervention there uh, far more costly than it is in the city center this is why efficiency drops as you move away from the wealthiest quintile um, and the quality drops as well remember so the the, the it cost increases but the quality decreases as well, and those two things are hampering. So now, in terms of um, intervention coverage and potential, so in terms of uh, drop in quality, we really struggle to find any information. How, what information did we actually need? We, we need to somehow see how the effectiveness of community case management uh, drops by under five mortality rate increasing. So we used the increase. Uh, under 5 mortality rate as a proxy for the quintiles in the country because no matter what quintile in the country means in Peru versus uh, Bangladesh versus uh, Nigeria, uh, uh, they all have some underlying under 5 mortality rate. So we could then, if we could know, know the relationship of community case management effectiveness and how it drops by under 5 mortality rate, then we could calibrate it and adjust to whatever the under 5 mortality rate was in each quintile of each country, it, because obviously quintile 5 in Peru was still better off than quintile 5 in Bangladesh. So they don't deserve the same uh, level of effectiveness, they deserve the level of effectiveness which is put in the relation of under 5 mortality rate that you have in that quintile, okay? Right, so we tried to model that and we found these dots and you can see there's very few of those dots, maybe nine data points and they're all over the place a little bit but luckily we knew one thing, we knew that uh, whenever under 5 mortality rate is zero that means that the effectiveness of community case management would be 100% so we could at least have some starting point to draw the line from and basically this is what we feel, we feel that if you are reaching the levels of under 5 mortality rate of about 160 per thousand live births that means that the quality of your community case management drops to having effectiveness of only 20% rather than 80% that it should have or even 100% in, in if, if everything is ideal, right? So, um, so this is the line we used and for, for this graph and then we moved towards this and here what we needed was the difference in burden and this is the difference in burden again under 5 mortality rate by wealth quintile which we had but we needed pneumonia right so uh, we needed to partition the burden in each of these countries and this is what we've done based on the CHURGS um, basically um, assessment of uh, regional uh, and national level uh, causes of death which they did luckily so we had not only the cause of death for the world but we had the partition of the burden of death by cause for each diseases and then we did it also for equity strata modeling on under 5 mortality rate uh, underlying each of these quintiles and basically so, so basically we, we had an understanding from the CHURG's work how the pie chart with the causes of deaths, how the causes of deaths proportions change as the, under, the total under 5 mortality rate changes. Clearly 
the higher the total under five mortality rate, the higher the burden of the disease of the poverty, such as pneumonia and diarrhea. And the lower, then the higher the burden of, say, preterm birth and low birth weight and so on, um, and th that, are, that are really, uh, you know, newborns or even others, such as cancers and accidents, uh, start being more important and disease of poverty less important, okay? Good, so um, uh, thanks to that, we could then populate the data we needed for this graph, and this allowed us to then calculate the cost effectiveness. And this is what we found. These are the then big picture data after we ran the equis on these five countries. We were interested in what if we invested and in, say one million dollars or any amount of money in the wealthiest 10 percent versus more of the same. More of the same meant uh, just doing what already has led to that situation uh, where, where this one million would certainly be spent if nothing, if Equist was not looked at. And uh, basically this is uh, showing you uh, what if you um, uh, invested community case management on everything in the wealthiest 10 percent, uh, what would happen if you were equity neutral, so more of the same, uh, 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 sorry, equity neutral would be all in the quintile three. So then in the poorest 10% or mainstream is just more of uh, the same. And this is then showing that estimate number of lives saved in mainstream versus equity promoting models for the same investment, $1 million mainstream in Nigeria would save 5,000 uh, uh, children. Uh, that's more of the same approach, ju just if nothing changed, if, if the trends continued. One million deliberately um, uh, invested in the poorest 10% would save 6,000 children. So it was better to target the poor and actually this conclusion for community case management stood firm for all five countries and you can see how in Bangladesh actually the difference was the smallest simply because it was a very equitable uh, burden already in the beginning, whereas in Peru the difference was the largest because uh, um, clearly the vast majority of the burden was. So you know the Peru was a good example. Um, Peru was actually the good example because the, the burden was uh, primarily focused among the poor, but the country was developed well enough to allow reaching the poor first. So Peru is clearly a fantastic candidate country where pro-poor um, uh, strategies would work really well and make a big uh, difference, okay? Uh, the problem with some countries we, we were worried to have, but luckily no such country we encountered, is that we would show that just doing more of the same would be actually saving more lives than, uh, than uh, targeting the poor. But, but in, in, in community case management in all five countries it turned out to be better to target the poor than, and, and this is something you need to really understand before you decide how to spend your money in your country, uh, is um, basically uh, uh, would it be better to just target the poor rather than uh, uh, just do more of the same. And for most countries this is the case and you can see that you know the, the difference in Peru was clearly the biggest and in Bangladesh was the smallest uh, uh, simply because it was already an equitable burden. Now what are the important things to consider when choosing health intervention for polio for financial support? Clearly the structure of the disease burden in the population, uh, most cost-effective interventions for each part of the burden, intervention with cross-cutting potential which can reach more causes and affect more causes at once, relationships and interactions between interventions whether there's any synergy, balance between existing and emerging interventions, value for money, overall burden reduced for overall cost, and so-called program budgeting and marginal analysis, because at the end of it all, you also need to build your portfolio and to define your portfolio of, of investments and decide uh, of all those options which are more or less cost effective, which ones you want to focus on. And sometimes when you're balancing the existing and emerging interventions, it may turn out to be good to be long-term thinking because if these are the years and this is the burden reduction, if you're investing in the existing intervention you may eventually reach a plateau of what you can do, whereas if you're investing in some new emerging interventions you may actually not have results for a number of years but then later 
achieve more. So that's another problem to think about when you're planning your portfolio. And basically, one thing that impact does not have yet, and that would be a very useful addition to it, is once you have this understanding of what is more or less equitable and more or less cost effective, you need to chart what is going on with investments in health at the moment for a country and you know 32 percent of funding going into that program 10 percent in that program and so on and you should then project what will this investment cause in terms of reduction in disease burden in 5 10 15 20 years and then ideally equist would allow you to understand that you could just drop these three because simply they are already being somehow represented here and you're going to lose li very, very little um, of um, the burden reduction if you just uh, free some of the budget. And then pick from your list of cost-effective and equitable interventions and put some of the money into five new programs which look very promising. And this eventually allows you to reduce more of the burden over time because it's a better balanced portfolio of investment in health. So that is something that we really need. So going back to those papers, reminding you this is where it all started from in 2012 uh, with the thinking of the conceptual frameworks. What happened after that is that Mickey Chopra, as a director of health in UNICEF, chief of health, he took it to UNICEF's research center in Innocento in Florence. And there people were, uh, during the 2013 and 2014, developing the data science platform where they tried to populate uh, um, uh, computer software with as much information as possible to allow a practical uh, use of Equist for planning purposes for healthcare budgets in low and middle income countries. And then from 2015 onwards, uh, the UNICEF country offices were empowered with this software and started implementing it. And we are now having uh, the first uh, summer school in global health economics and priority setting here in Edinburgh to look at what happened since that 2015 to 2019 in the last four years and where has Equist actually been implemented with some uh, uh, good results and what could we possibly do to make it even better and more uh, usable. And this is a video on YouTube which explains how this uh, software works and we today have Sharul from us from UNICEF headquarters in New York who will take us through this uh, software and how it works and how can it be implemented, which is going to be our uh, next presentation in this series. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.